Welcome to the Tune Under podcast, the Southern Hemisphere's only dedicated Newcastle United podcast. I'm Jack with you today and with me is Dimmy. Dimmy, how are you doing? Very well, Jack. Very well. Still recovering from uh, this morning's late winner, but uh, going very well. You've had two of your clubs have scored injury time heading headed winners this week, haven't you? This weekend. Two, yeah, two smashing headers. Couldn't make it up. Both 2-1 wins, wins as well. So it's uh, fantastic. Besides the AFL, which we won't talk about. The yeah, yeah. Fantastic uh, 48 hours. I was going to say, you're on a little bit of a roll. I think last weekend, all of all three of your clubs won, didn't three they? Three from three. Last week was three, three from three, which was the dream weekend. This week was two from three, not too bad. And uh, too bad. We, we roll to the next week. You'll take it. And we've also we've, got, we've also got to say Konnichiwa tonight to Jamie, mm-hmm. who in Hiroshima. Hi. Um, Jamie, you're clearly not Japanese. You're from the northeast. Um, I, I am. Yeah, I'm a... Uh... Yeah, I live in Hiroshima. I've been here about um, eight years, but um, everyone here supports Liverpool and Man United, so it's nice to talk to other Newcastle fans. So, yeah, what took to, what took you to what took you to Hiroshima then, and what kind of what's it like trying to follow Newcastle? Because I think you're on pretty much the same time zone as yeah, as I think you're an hour behind. There's only an hour difference, so I. I came traveling about uh, nine years ago and I, I ended up spending a month in Japan. I've actually got a cousin who lived lived here and has been here for about 40 years. So I came over to see him and I just thought it was a cool place and I found a job. So I teach English here and, um, and yeah, following, following the, the tune here, obviously social media makes it a lot easier to kind of interact with other Newcastle fans, but mm. same as you lads getting up at, daft o'clock to watch the games i messaged you last night after the, the game yeah. getting up at 3 45 a.m for palace now seems like a sensible idea after bruno's last minute winner but <laughs> but yeah it's um it's strange because a lot of my friends here they support man united and liverpool my english and irish friends and and other and spurs and other big teams and i was always kind of like the 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 poor kid supporting a shit team but now they're all now they're all like a bit nervous. So he was uh, laughing now, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, 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 yeah, and yeah. It's uh, you know the the human rights thing comes into it, and I just have yeah. to I just have to keep calm. And we're we're gonna have to get used to that, you know. And that's we've said on this pod before. That's part of, that comes with the territory now. So we'll get used to it, and we'll get on with it, and we'll yeah. hopefully start winning some stuff. Yeah, it's uh, it, it is. It's a difficult conversation to have, but um, but it's just it's just so good on the pitch at the moment now, isn't it? It's yeah. It's the most we're gonna important. get we're gonna get into that. I just want to briefly say that I've been to Hiroshima, and I was when I was coming to Australia, I travelled in Japan a little bit because um, my wife's got family there. What a place! Please. Like I can I can understand why you have decided to stay there. It's an absolutely brilliant place, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's um, it it's just everything everything works and everything's so clean and 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 when I, I love i love going back home obviously i haven't been back home from from the pandemic but um but yeah when i when i go back to england i just i just get annoyed <laughs> like the, the things that you know it's not working and things but but yeah it is it's an exciting place to live and so my wife um is is russian so we're two foreigners mm-hmm. in japan so it's uh yeah every day is there's something that catches me out or you know is is a shock to me every day here it's and yeah. Hiroshima Hiroshima is a little bit like Newcastle it's got lots of bridges hasn't it I, I vividly remember that about Hiroshima it has got loads of rivers and loads of bridges it actually means uh wide islands in in Japanese so oh yeah um there is a lot of similarities to Newcastle, actually. They're they're very very um, passionate about their baseball team here, the Hiroshima Carp. Yeah. So it's um, th- there are a lot of similarities, and the accent as well here is is quite a unique accent for Japan as well. So it's, there you go. It's then. A lot of similarities with Newcastle, but yeah, it's you come good to play. you come to the Two Under Pod to listen to us review the football, and you get a, a lesson in Japanese. It's absolutely Japan's absolutely fantastic, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I, 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 really, <laughs> I just hope that they'll come and do a pre-season tour here sometime. But yeah, but yeah. 
All right, we will be back after this and we're going to get straight into the fantastic Leicester game. Right, so before Eddie Howe arrived at Newcastle in October 2021, we'd never beaten Brighton in the Premier League. We hadn't gone nine games unbeaten in the Premier League since 2011. We'd never kept a clean sheet against the Wolves in the Premier League. We hadn't beaten Leicester at St. James's Park since 2014. All of those stats I've just read out have been corrected in the last two months. And we're here to talk about the, that last stat I read out. So the 2-1 victory that Newcastle had over Leicester, which was 11.15pm kickoff time here in Australia. 10.15 for you in uh, in Japan, Jamie. Yep. It on the face of it, this sounded like quite a good kickoff time because it was Easter Sunday, so it was like 11.15, might be able to just get a little bit of sleep, might just stay up and then won't get to bed too late. But then in the event, that didn't quite happen because of what happened in the, the 95th minute, which we're going to really get stuck into. But really, I just want to get your reaction first to, to the win then. Dimmy, <clears throat> massive, massive win. We're up to We're up to 37 points now. Obviously, the, the manner of a win like that is going to get everybody more excited. And we've had our fair share of late goals conceded this season. So what was your what was your overall reaction to the win? And how hard was it to try and get to sleep after the full-time whistle? Well, firstly, on the second point, couldn't get to sleep. Um, like, like yourself, I was searching for any sort of post-game reaction, talk back interview anything to watch what just happened i found a bruno interview just after the game which was sensational he was having a go in english when they were the, the sky commentator was speaking to him but in, ter- in terms of the result i think it was quite a mature performance from us i think if you know what what leicester's good at they're dynamic in attack they're fantastic on on, on the break and you can't give them can't give them space and can't give them the ball and i think we're a little bit more circumspect as we were to a couple of couple of games against Spurs where we just completely opened up and were picked off by Son and Kane. So I thought it was quite a mature display from us. And despite all the ball that they had, I thought they probably didn't travel to Bradford all probably all all match really. So I thought very mature and yeah, for the context of the season, we're just we're just up and up. I'm I'm actually a bit disappointed because I did predict a few weeks ago we're gonna get 14 points before that. Um before yes, that he did. game, then then Lee talked me down to twelve, and all of a sudden, <laughs> I think we're on we're on we're on seven or eight already. I'm thinking, geez, four was maybe unders, but uh, but no, it's uh, it's happy days for us. Yeah, because you said that we're going to match last season's tally, which would have been four. Yeah, we're going to get fourteen points from when you said that. So yeah. Um, yeah. it did sound quite ambitious at the time, but you know, when you're winning every game at home, you know what can you say? We're we're on we're on a roll. Exactly right, exactly right. And there's still plenty of winnable games to come as well. So I think uh, we may just about get there or even even beat that points performance, which would be absolutely staggering if we do. Jamie, I don't know about you, but we've got this kind of thing now that we can't go to sleep until we've seen the team photo. We need to see their team photo, Serena's photo. So oh, we're kind of we we'll kind of keep waiting for it. And it didn't arrive last night until 2.22 a.m. Queensland time. So I was like, yeah, that, now, that's like an hour and a half after the game's finished or something. So we were kind of getting towards it. But yeah, how was your, um, how was your, we were messaging a little bit on Twitter, but how was yeah. your experience of trying to get to sleep after that? Uh, not not too good. Um, I, as I mentioned to you earlier, I've, I, my, my parents are visiting at the moment. So me and my dad were watching the game together, which was nice. And um, it was just like, it was winding down and you were thinking it was going to be, a draw, which still would have been a good point. I said before this run of three home games, I thought five points would have beat just you know done us absolutely fine. Obviously, we started with a win against Wolves, and then, but yeah, just the manner of the win. It's I think it's the most like release of emotion I've I've had since mm. this whole since the takeover and everything. But watching the game, just the manner of the win against a good team as well. 
um, from a player who's just going to be absolutely massive for us. So yeah, I was yeah. I was going to go to bed and I, I watched the highlights about three or four times afterwards, and I had another drink and I wasn't too clever at work this morning. But, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, you did. At least we had a public holiday. Yeah, you didn't get that, did you? At least I don't what, sorry? We had a public holiday here. It was Easter Monday. Oh, so yeah, yeah. None of us have been at work. Yeah, I I had to um I had to go to work at I had to get my daughter up and then go to work at like seven o'clock. So yeah, it was my alarm went off this morning and I was my instant reaction was not good, but then I remembered about the Bruno's header and everything was fine. So yeah. <laughs> I remember earlier in the season, um it was I can't remember which game it was, but I had to go to work and I just watched us conceding a late goal. I was like, but only won one game all season by that point. And I was like, what's going on here? This is just like we need we deserve some we just give us something. Give us something to to make these late nights or these early mornings worth it, you know? And we oh. absolutely like un one hundred percent got that last night. So yeah, that's for was, that's for it, every all cool, of us who <laughs> that's for all of us who struggle through in the middle of the night um that win so that's very yeah it was very very exciting finish and twitter was getting refreshed a lot um mm. for about two hours after the game yeah and then the, and the, like i said the photo did arrive at 222 so i was able to try and go to sleep then yeah i i love how how is never prominent in the photos he's just kind of always just you, you have to get a magnifying glass out to find him don't yeah, you, you to I, think, yeah I think it says a lot about him to be honest it's um yeah but uh, yeah but going back to the time difference as i said to you it just makes getting up at, i've i've got a i'll be getting up at 3:30 for the for the Dallas game and I'll watch it and go to work and Bruno's head is make, makes that seem like a sensible use of my time. So <laughs> It is a sensible use of your time. Yeah, You'll get no arguments from that here. Yeah. So I just want to have a little talk about what uh, Eddie Howe has actually managed to do since he has come into the club. Um, he had a bit of a difficult start. We had some quite hard fixtures and he was he was left with a complete mess. Let's be, you know, let's be honest about it. I think we had five points just from draws at that point. But the league table since he took over, we're actually eighth on that league table in the, since he took over. So we've had nine wins. He's had nine wins, five draws, seven defeats, thirty-two points. But the league table in twenty twenty-two is it's a remarkable thing to look at. We're third. Yes. We're third in the in the league table in twenty twenty-two. We've got eight wins, two draws. Three defeats, twenty six points. We've got two more points than Man City with two extra games played, Absolutely. and we've got one point less than Spurs, uh, but we've played two less games than them. It's um, it's actually unbelievable when you think about where we were at. And um, and I was actually listening back to one of the old pods we did after the Brentford win, and we're all obviously really excited about that. And that felt like a like a momentous win because we went above them. But mm. at that point, we were still only four points above Burnley and they had a game in hand, you know? So even then, which felt like we were well on the way to safety then, we really weren't when you look back at it like that. And for us to have kept this momentum going is absolutely fantastic. And we'll, I can talk about Eddie Howe all day, but Jamie, I'm going to let you have a little, um, a little go. What's your kind of assessment of the job Eddie Howe has done since he came in? Ah, oh, it's... So my own going back to when he got the job, my own feeling when he got the job was I always really rated him at Bournemouth. And I remember they beat Bournemouth beat us just before McLaren got sacked. Mm -hmm. And I said, I think we should get Eddie Howe because he's just a great young coach. Obviously, we ended up getting Rafa. I also wanted Eddie Howe when Rafa left. But I have to be honest, I was not, I was a bit concerned about him coming in um, basically because of, I thought we needed someone who would tighten us up at the back and make us mm. more difficult to play against. Um, I mean, I saw a stat that even his highest finish at Bournemouth, I think when they finished ninth, they still had the third worst defensive record. So I, as much as I do rate him, I was concerned about his appointment. And there's a lot of the wins we've got yes, yesterday and also the Wolves game and, and so many where they're not particularly good games to watch, but the way 
he has made us so horrible to play against. We have gone from being the easiest team in the Premier League to play against under Steve Bruce. Mm-hmm. We were the easiest team to play against. And now we don't concede many chances. We we press, we, we, we close down. And the fitness levels of the players is obviously... Um, is obviously just chalk and cheese from what it was under Bruce. Mm. But I don't think we all love him and we know the job he's done has just been monumental. I don't think how we'll ever get the credit he deserves outside of Newcastle fans, mm. like in mm. the media. For three reasons, I think. Number one, people hate us because of the nature of the takeover. If it mm. was Everton, I understand it. If it was Everton or Leeds or Villa who the Saudis had bought, I would probably feel the same. Um Second one is people will just point to the money that he spent in January. Mm-hmm. But money is not spending money is not guarantee a success. Look at like Everton and Man United for a start. And also, and also he chose how to spend that money. So they were actually he was de facto the director of football. So he he picked Kieran Trippier, he picked Matt Target, Dan Byrne, Chris yeah. Wood, and Bruno, you know? So his, that's yeah, that's right. His, what you've said there. The money is important. Been, yeah, incredible. I had one of my friends here say to me when we appointed him, oh, it's a terrible appointment. He's he's dreadful in the transfer window. He wastes money. That was obviously because his last season at Bournemouth, things got away from him. But I'm sorry, you don't take a team from 10 points adrift at the bottom of League Two to ninth in the Premier League in six or seven years if you're bad at recruiting players. Mm. It's just impossible. But he is... The foundations, all the fundamentals are, are there for us to like add some good players to the team. And what I love is he had a sabbatical from the game after Bournemouth. He's clearly gone away and just upskilled so much. Mm. Um, we're ve- we're very different from what Bournemouth were. Um, we are his his in game management is what impresses me the most. I think is that that's what is absolute night and day compared to what we were used to before mm. um but yeah i i mean he signed a two and a half year contract i i personally think that at the end of the season i think they need to give him a new contract mm. for a, a longer five year contract and because i think like a lot of people i thought when we got how it was like you know, little Stop by that. little, and yeah. there, there would be a manager maybe after how if the the plans to get in the Champions League and challenge for things. But I'm really starting to think that he's still young. He's you know he he just he just seems to he seems to be learning all the time. And I mm. absolutely love him. I mm. I would have done anything to avoid listening to Steve Bruce's press conferences and after <laughs> interviews. And I I now I actively make time to watch. The full press conference. Yeah. Event. I, I, I Twenty-five minutes. They're great, aren't they? The, yeah, the yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I was watching his uh, press conference before the Leicester game with my, my 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 wife and my my dad and me. And my dad were just like leaning forward into the TV, yeah. <laughs> confused at the whole thing. But yeah, yeah. He's he's it's it's unbelievable. It no one, even the most optimistic Newcastle fan or even Eddie Howe's biggest fan, could have imagined that it was going to turn out like this yeah and we we spoke to serena taylor the club photographer mm-hmm. and just some of the things she told us about the culture he's set in mm-hmm. the little things he's doing to include the whole staff you know it sounds like quite kind of basic stuff but it's all about setting a culture and setting a team culture for geared towards success Dimi. Your thoughts on sort of, yeah, the last few games and you, just Eddie Howe in general, like you've spoken about him before, but did you did you see this this coming at all? Absolutely not, to be honest. Um, I, I was confident that we could get out of trouble, but not, not in the way we've done it at the moment. I mean, to go, I think we went, was it seven or eight, nine games unbeaten? We went from January onwards to win... Yeah, nine games, yeah. Four, yeah, nine games to win four out of five. I think we did... To win now five home games in a row where we hadn't won two home games in a row for a long time, let alone five home games in a row. Um, but but the thing that's really impressed me with how is he's taken so-called garbage footballers and players we'd think who are absolutely well below the Premier League level to now being 
competent and at some cases, big Joe cases, quality mm. Premier League starters. I mean, Joe Linton's a different player. Even even our mate Emil Kraft at right back, we were making fun of him on this podcast. Uh, many I times, wasn't making fun of him, but other people were. Well, all right, you were, you were, you were defending him, but <laughs> me and a few it's others so- were. And um, he's yeah, Crafts has improved. Uh, Cher has improved. It's if it, you can you can keep going down the list of, of the squad. Everybody really who's who's got a consistent goal in the team has improved. So that's that's down to coaching. That's down to management, and that's that's down to Eddie. Yeah, he's a, he's a coach, isn't he? That's what he is. And he said one of the most impressive things he said when he first came in was they were asking him about January transfer window, obviously, and he just said, "I'm not interested in that at the moment because it's October. I've got a squad yeah. here that I'm going to work with." And he started name checking people straight away. Uh, he name checked Jolin and Shelby immediately, yeah. and said, "These are good. These are good players for me to work with," and they're in, their performance has improved, you know, immediately. Um, so just there's not coach, one player who he hasn't. There's not one player yeah. who has not improved or has gone backwards under him. Everybody's just, yeah, it's it's incredible. And when before the takeover went through, if you'd have said to somebody just before the takeover went through, we're going to get taken over, and like if you'd have said to me, if you'd have said to me to name the first players that you would have sold, it would have been Kraft and Joe Linton. And now yeah. I, I wouldn't. I keep them both. Um, yeah, it's bizarre. It's he's it's, it's a, absolutely brilliant. He's done an absolutely remarkable job. He's a he's, he's a brilliant character for, for the Newcastle job because he doesn't get too high, he doesn't get too low. He yeah. manages he manages to keep this equilibrium, which is just what the club needs. Because as everybody knows, it's a very um, up and down club where things can yeah. go get you know they can get really excited straight away, or things can get very low and that still does happen you know even after we got beaten by by Everton and Spurs there was a lot there was kind of a lot of criticism coming but he just knows what he's doing he trusts his process his staff know what they're doing and the result is the this league table mm-hmm. which I've just flashed up so we're now in 14th after that win we're on 37 points which I think would have been enough points to keep Teams safe for pretty much every season that the Premier League's ever had, other than that year when West Ham went down on 42 points. Yeah. But Burnley are there on 25 points now in 18th. Uh, they, they've got a game in hand, but the 12 points behind us, Dimmy, you've been saying for weeks we need to stop looking, looking down and start looking up. Even at half time in this game, Burnley were winning and we were drawing. So the gap was down to eight points then. Yeah, I was... It's just. Yeah, it's just ingrained into us as Newcastle fans to keep keep doing that and keep looking behind. I think. Um, Honestly, but, w- right? Yeah. If we if we beat obviously if we beat Palace and Southampton lose their next game, we can go above Southampton. But I can tell you now, if Southampton were playing Burnley tonight, I'd want Southampton to win. It's just yeah. ingrained into me. It's yeah. That's that's what that's what it's like at the moment. But if you, I mean, if you look at this, like. You know, nobody's thinking that Palace might get relegated, or I, I can't believe we've gone above Villa. That's brilliant. Nobody's thinking that Villa are going to get relegated. You know, even Leeds. Um, I think that last spot does look like it's between Burnley and Everton. I think Watford and Norwich are pretty much gone now. Um, Dimmy, what's your kind of hopes for the next six games, other than winning every single one of them? <laughs> what's your what, what's your realistic hopes, and where do you think how high do you think we can actually get here? Um, realistically, if we can match, which I said a few weeks ago, if we can match our points total from last season, that would be sensational, obviously for me, but also for the club to, to reach this, the same level from how poor we were for the first, first four or five months of the season. But if you look at the teams above us, I mean, we played Palace coming up, but besides that, um, the rest of the, the rest of the games, Norwich, we're playing, I think on the weekend coming up as well. So there's two games coming up that potentially could be not to, not to jinx us could be four to six points there. And all of a sudden we're, we're pushing towards the top 10. I mean, if we finish in top 10, Eddie Howe, I said it last week that he might, he won't get, he won't get manager of the season consideration, but if we end up finishing in the top 10, he's has to be in the top two or three in terms yeah. of manager of the year. 
it's going to be it's going to be Klopp or Guardiola, isn't it? The way that whichever team wins, you know, yeah. the, the trophies that they're in. But for somebody to come in, we should just point out as well that no team has ever lot, um, not won the first fourteen games and survived. And we've just looked like we're going to do that with absolute comfort at the end of the day. Yeah, that's the... So, yeah, Jamie, what's your what are you hoping for sort of for the next? Uh, what, um, what, how think, high do you think we can get? I don't, I think I mean. I don't think we'll beat Man City or Liverpool, but I have absolute confidence that we'll give them a game. Um, and that's the difference with how even after even after the Spurs result, it was three defeats in a row. Spurs was terrible, but I just had full faith that they would, the, you know, they'd be putting things right on, you know, in training, which I did not have at all under Bruce. Yeah. Um, I think. Palace and Norwich are winnable games. I think Arsenal at Arsenal at St James's, we can beat Arsenal. If they're mm-hmm. if they're not at the races with how good we we are off the ball, I totally think we can we can beat Arsenal. I'm just so like you just said, being the safe with something to spare, I was always I've always looked at the last few fixtures and that run of Liverpool, City, Arsenal, mm-hmm. and then Burnley away on the last day. That's like <laughs> We could easily have lost three games in a row against the good teams, and then if it's the gaps proper cut, mm. then you go into Burnley. But yeah, so I still think I know this is mental, but I still think I, I want another win just to completely. <laughs> but the but, magic um, forty points. The yeah, the magical forty points. But um, I think I think we'll finish twelfth. Oh yeah. That's what With I specific think. Specific predictions. Which, 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 I mean, I'd have, I would have snapped your hand off for seventeenth when Howe was appointed. It's quite, so. it's quite, it's quite exciting as well that we could actually have a say in the title race as well. Liverpool will not be looking forward to coming to St James's Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jurgen Klopp's already crying about it. About the oh, time. Jesus. So uh, that's that's not going to be a game that they're looking forward to. Um, and like you know. We're going to get into the Leicester game more and talk about some of the other games where we just haven't conceded shots. Never mind conceded many goals. You know, there's Chelsea, uh, there was Chelsea, and there's Brighton as well who barely troubled the goalkeeper. So, and these are these are all good teams. So Liverpool are not going to find that match at St James's Park easy, especially with the crowd the way it is at the moment. So, I think. I think we can push. We can push. Start pushing towards the top half. It'd just it'd be nice to finish above teams like Villa, um, who yeah, have had you know at different times have been said to have had a great season, and who replaced their manager with Gerard about the, the similar time that Howe came in for us. So that would be a good uh, something for us to aim for as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to have another very quick break, and we're going to get into the Leicester game in a little bit more detail we will be back after this so i'm just going to get some of the stats up from the leicester game so this this has become a little bit of a pattern where we have seeded a lot of possession in games Mm. Uh, the te- teams like Brighton and Leicester have had a lot of possession, but we've we've outshot them, we've outshot them in attempts and on targets, and we've had a higher X- XG as well. The XG in this game was actually two point four for us, two point oh four versus zero point seven one, which when you consider that you know we only had the ball thirty one percent of possession, we're doing something right defensively. You know, uh, we're, we're working really well, Jamie. These stats do they kind of reflect your your view of the game? So we had we had thirty one percent possession, sixteen shots to eight, seven shots on target to two, three corners to five, and there were ten fouls each. Do these stats reflect your um, view of the game? Not really, because I think I, I actually thought the second half of this game was really similar to when we beat Brighton at St James's Park, and I think you know just because you've got possession doesn't mean that you are in, you're in control of the game. I think Leicester always dominate the ball against against teams. They're a really good side. Um, I know they haven't had the best season, but they're a really good side. And Brendan Rodgers is a really good coach. 
Um, there was one stat that uh, came... I don't know who was commentating on the game for you guys. I think I had... Um, one thing that's great, just side point, about yeah. when Muto leaving Newcastle is now all our games have got English commentary because they can't be bothered with us anymore. So um, <laughs> I think I had... Um, I think it might have been David Prutton who was on mine. And after 10 minutes, it came up and it said, I was thinking we'd started really well and we were on the front foot and we were in their faces mm -hmm. and pressing well. And then the stat came up and said that they'd had 70% of the ball. Yeah. And even the commentator said, I'm, I'm really surprised by that. It seems that Newcastle have been, been on top. Yeah, it didn't um, feel like it didn't feel like that at that point, I remember, yeah. Yeah, so I think, look, as good as how a job how has done and as much as I have a lot of um, affection for this group of players, they, they are still a, a few of them are, you know, the, we will sign better players. We we still are short of still behind a lot of teams in terms of quality off the ball. We just seem to be doing everything off the ball. Well, but it's the, it's the amount of the, the, the very few chances we concede that seems to be when teams are on top, I, I, I always back us to stay in games, which is the biggest thing. Mm. And, and sorry to keep going back to before how, but it always seemed that once a team start, once we started and if the other team was on top, it never, there was never any chance of it changing mm -hmm. in the game. Yeah. I always yeah. feel that if it's even if we're getting like battered in terms of possession and teams keep coming, I always know that we will at some point, you know, turn it over and, mm. and get, and get higher up the pitch. Which I think goes down to how's in-game management. Yeah, and we've, yeah, we've, it, always, we've always got the break as well. You know, we've got quick players to go on the break. So most of these shots and that we had were a result of counter attacks um, from Maxi getting forward or from Miggy sort of running forward quickly. Dimmy, your kind of take on these stats? What did did it look like a sixty-nine percent to thirty-one? Present possession game to you. Do we? Do, should we even care about possession and focus on it so much? What do you think? I think for this iteration of how we of how we play and in the squad we have, I think possession doesn't matter. I think ideally going forward, hopefully we're progressing in the next few years. We can bridge that gap a little bit better and start playing a lot better with the ball. That that will help players like Bruno do a bit more and and show show out a bit more. But but I think. With the game, like Jamie said, it was a lot similar to Brighton. We were sitting a little bit deeper. They were sort of passing it well and truly outside of our 18-yard box. Didn't really get in the box to penetrate much. So we, we looked quite comfortable. And there was always that chance that one John Joe Shelby long ball or Maxi would do something and we're away two on two, three on three. We just we just lacked probably that one other quick play with Maxi to keep up. There was a couple of times where he would burst into the box and there was five defenders and there was no attackers. <laughs> And Chris would just busted his gut to get there, but he just couldn't get there. So yeah. that's something to work on. But I think possession-wise, yeah, we let them have the ball. We we sat deep. We didn't give them the space. And I think the, the plan worked to perfection. Yeah, so before the goal that they scored, uh, they, they had had more possession, but they hadn't necessarily created any chances. I think they had one shot and goal by that point. Their goal, um, corner, and it was... a. To be fair, it was a very well-worked training ground corner goal. I don't know if we maybe switched off a little bit, but it was clever. It was a clever ball into Perez, who did a good flick, and then Luckman had his shot. What do you think, um, Jamie, do you think that Dubravka could have potentially done a bit better with this? Or do you think the range of it made it difficult and the amount of bodies in front of him? I think it, I, he got quite a lot of stick on Twitter, which I was thought was I was a bit sad to see um yeah when it's when it's coming through that amount of bodies from such close range it is difficult um and it was right it was it was right so close to his feet mm. that it's like the most difficult position for them to adjust isn't it I think mm, maybe he could but he's he's got enough goodwill in the bank with me yeah any Martin Dubravka to just it's easy to say that we ended up winning the game, but um, it was a really well. I mean, you could tell from the reaction on the Leicester bench that that was they were really happy with how that had come off. And it, mm. I don't know about you, like the my the camera was on the assistant coach. It was like I don't yeah. know. You guys, watch Ted Lasso. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I've seen that, yeah, that yeah. episode where like Nate came up with the false nine play and he was getting all the plaudits. It was it reminded me of that that like the assistant coach was just like <laughs> had his five minutes of fame. But um yeah, Dubravka probably could have done a bit better, but it was difficult. But he's he's been he's been brilliant recently. So yeah. Dimmy, I know I know what you think about this because I saw your tweet about it. You don't think that it was a Dubravka error, do you? Nah, look, I'm I'm probably a little bit biased in Jamie's vision as well. I do I do love Dubravka. And I have been a goalkeeper in the past, futsal wise, not a great one, but have been goalkeeper at futsal wise. And when the shot gets cracked at you from that close, from with bodies in front of you, it's yeah. virtually impossible to adjust your body. You've just got to have a bit of luck. It's going to hit your foot and it goes it goes wide. Yeah. You, you can't you can't do anything about that. So. I I definitely give him a pass. I think the the issue was no one tracked the run and he came from the edge of the box and sort of strolled onto the ball. So now yeah. Dubravka, I don't think he could have done much more than that. You've got you've got to be switched on as a team, don't you, to these kind of situations. And when you're playing against when you're playing against clever opposition who who not only have the ideas but also have the execution. And Perez, we know Perez well. He he played a big part in that goal with the the clever little flick. But it can be hard. Like sometimes you just have to hold your hands up and say, "Look, that was a really well worked, well worked goal." Uh, there, there are things you know. Eddie has a perfectionist. There'll be things he can think of that we could have done a bit better with the goal. But I think, um, yeah, Dubravka. I think the thing is, like you said, if he'd have stood there and just put his foot out, he could have controlled it, and picked it up. You know, but that just doesn't happen, does it? With goalkeepers, they're they're accustomed and they're trained to go with the hands. So. When it is that low, it's and close to the body, and there's that many bo- you know bodies in front, it can be difficult. So it's definitely not a big goalkeeping error. But I, th- I still think he himself will probably be a little bit disappointed that it went through him, um, with with it being so close to him. But for me, I think the pleasing thing again was the our reaction. So yeah. it wasn't quite it wasn't quite as quick a response as the as the Everton game where we scored straight away, but. You know, we we didn't we didn't concede any more chances in that time, and um, we didn't let our heads go down, which is something that we used to do all the time. And it that, was good that that's it was, massive yeah, thing. it was good to see that we didn't do that with without Trippier on the pitch as well. Yeah, not not we, just the players, but us because like if you you know yeah before it was when we conceded the first goal that was it. Yeah, I think I saw a a, a ridiculous stat about under Bruce we. In all of Bruce's games, we only took seven points from conceding the first goal. Yeah, um, it was just game over, wasn't it? Pretty much, it was. Yeah. yeah, it was just like, oh well, you know. It was always that feeling that there's no way they they aren't going to score another one, and it's going to be really mm. hard. But I just they scored, and I was like, oh, you know, it's all right. There's still time. <laughs> mm. That's the, that's the that's the best thing about it. And then eleven minutes later. Um, well, probably ten minutes later, but then there was a little bit of a VAR delay with this one. What did you make of this equaliser, Dimmy? Uh, this was a really strange kind of VAR. Uh, what did you? Yeah, you go first with this one. What did you think of the the goal and the VAR situation? Very strange, but in the end, very proud of my compatriot Jared Gillett, who uh, had the had the cojones to go go to the monitor and say, "Yep, his hands were on the ball." That's a goal because, yeah, I don't know what they were looking at. They, it, it seemed the first replay seemed to show that his hands were nowhere near the ball. And then for some reason, they were showing Dan Byrne flick header, whether it hit yeah. his arm or yeah, whether he yeah. fouled somebody. I'm not sure what they were. It just seemed like another VAR incident where they're going to go through every millisecond of action before we <laughs> score to see if there's it something felt like they were looking for something. Like the, Spurs yeah. one, like the Spurs one with yeah. Shares free kick, they're going through offside, they're going through handball. Anything that could present that could prevent the goal, but fair play to Gillett because once once you could see that his hands weren't on the ball, it's it's fair game and very clever by uh, our, our mate Bruno. Very clever to stick his toe in. It was strange, wasn't it? Because Casper Schmeichel kind of just he was quite casual, like oh that's definitely going to be disallowed, but he must have known his hands were nowhere near it. I think goalkeepers are so used to being protected, and yeah, yeah. this this Correct. is a good. This was a good example of where VAR. We would say this because it benefited us, but genuinely, you know, goalkeepers are so overprotected that any 
any attacker anywhere near them is the likely to give a foul usually. So if, to say that it was just basically a goalkeeping error, and then Bruno was tenacious enough to get the get his foot on it twice and put it in, and I think it was quite clear that it it was a perfectly fair goal, Jamie. Yeah, I was to be honest when it first. Um... Watching it in real time, I didn't think it was going to be allowed. And then they kept showing the replay, and I was, and then the commentator on on my stream was saying, "There's nothing wrong with that. It's got to be given. It's got to be given." And then that got my hopes up. And but yeah, it was, yeah, it was brilliant when it was. Oh, what do you, what do you think of our just on the just as a side topic? Oh, uh, we've talked about this quite a few times. Yeah, it's um, I think my I don't like VAR at all. I think it, we should just go back to what it was with human error. But I think um, the problem isn't, yeah, we've said the problem isn't the technology, it's the it's the people who are in charge of yeah, it. It is, because it works in the Champions League and it worked in the World yeah. Cup. Yeah, yeah, we're just going over all ground, aren't we? But yeah, yeah, it's, um, it, it's there's times I've loved it. Last night was one of them. The, my favourite VAR moment ever was Shelby's goal away at Sheffield United. That was yes. absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Where they were like, they, they were said, "Well, that was that's obvious offside," and it just wasn't at all. And he just went yeah. and scored. And Chris Wilder was still complaining after that, wasn't he? Saying it wasn't a fair goal. Yeah. It was like it quite obviously was because he was very, very far onside. <laughs> I, I honestly think that was my favourite moment of the Bruce. Yeah, era. yeah. Not me. Um, yeah. So just just before we scored, right? So just before our goal. The possession was still 67-33 to Leicester and we'd had three shots each on goal. But then eight minutes after our goal, so in that period just after we scored, the possession had gone in the last... You know how they, they, they bring up the last five-minute possession thing? And it was 69-31 to 31 to us. So that goal had really given us a real shot and we'd actually started getting the foot on the ball. And we ended the half with 10 shots to their four. So mm. we'd, we'd had... Um, including our goal, we'd ended up having, you know, six more shots in between our goal and the end of the half, unless we had only had one more, you know. So that that gave us a real um, a real shot in the arm, as as goals often do. But it does it just does show that we do have the capability at times to get our foot on the ball and pass it when the when the game allows it. At half time, though, the stats were thirty seven percent to possession to us to sixty three to them. And we had a really low 63% passing accuracy um, to their 78. Yeah, it's, it's, so it was very low. And that's that again, that has been a feature of um, of games lately where we haven't been able to, you know, pass it accurately. Apart from Bruno, obviously, whose yeah. passing accuracy was 83%. So, you know, the whole team's 63 and Bruno's 83. So that shows you I, how I head and shoulders of he is. I think it's, I, I, I think Shelby's been brilliant in the last few months, but he is, he is a risk taker with the, with his passes, isn't he? Mm. Um, he, he does fair play to him. He does try and get, move us forward, but yeah, sometimes he just needs to keep possession a bit more. Yeah. That's like, th there's a time and place for it, isn't there? And it's not necessarily mm. a bad thing, but I want to, I want to ask you a little bit about this kind of conundrum we've got in the midfield at the moment, because our midfield, I've I've thought for a long time is our weakest position on the pitch. Me too. And then and then Joe Linton's turned into a midfielder, and we've signed Bruno. So all of a sudden, it's gone from being the weakest to probably being the strongest position on the pitch, where we wouldn't necessarily be looking to add somebody straight away. But it doesn't matter what combination of three we play in the middle; we still seem to concede a lot of, a lot of possession. Mm. So my question is really, what do we what do we want from the midfield going? forward and is this going to necessitate kind of a new system and move away from this 4-3-3 or are we going to need new players because I mean Bruno has got to be the the heart of the midfield the heart of the team for years to come but Dimi I'll come to you first on this one what do you think around what do you think is needed and how do we solve this kind of issue we've got where the strongest part of the team is also the one that's kind of conceded in this possession or again should we just stop caring so much about possession? Jimmy? Well, the short answer, I think, is we need better players next to Bruno, to be honest. I think we need players, which is not easy to do. There's not $40 million to spend on every single player on the team, but better players who can keep the ball, who are dynamic on the ball and, and can move, move forward. I mean, 
Shelby's done fantastically well with Howe, but I'm a, a bit concerned about his long-term future in terms of our, our best team. And even Big Joe, I, I don't want to upset Bobby, but Big Joe, he's, 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 he's a Patrick Vieira-esque. He's charges around the pitch, wins the ball, carries the ball, but he's still, for me, probably not the best technical on the ball in short spaces player like Bruno is. And he probably can't play those one, two little intricate passes. So I think the short answer is we need to find probably better midfield players who are equally as good as Bruno on the ball, which again, not easy to find, but yeah. that would be the start. Cause I think four, three, three suits suits with us playing with one striker and, and a couple of fast wingers. I think we just need to find a couple of better possession keeping midfielders. Yeah. Mm. And I was I was talking to a, another friend about this earlier as well, and he was saying it's the it's the whole team, you know. It's not just necessarily the three midfielders. You want your defenders, and you want your fullbacks, and your attackers to be able to keep possession as well. And that's all going to uh, contribute to this um, this ability to keep a little bit more possession and start controlling mm. the game a bit more. And obviously, I think having a creative attacking midfielder, somebody in the mold of a Christian Eriksen, is going to help that situation as well. Jamie, your thoughts on that uh, question? Yeah, so personally, I think a big priority for us this, this summer is I think we need to sign a, a quality holding midfielder um, mm-hmm. who can move the ball quicker. Because, and I haven't met Bobby yet, but if it's if it sounds like, is he a Joe Linton super fan? Yeah. yeah. So been, I, look, Joe Linton Linton has been brilliant and he does so much hard work off the ball and the transformation has been amazing. I still think he's quite slow at moving the ball. Mm. And regarding Bruno, when, when we signed him, I... I'd never really watched him play at Leon, I'll be honest. I'd heard of him, um, but I'd never really watched him. And everyone kept saying, oh, we're signing this like deep lying defensive midfielder, you know, who is so good at breaking up play and 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 moving the ball quickly and starting transitions. And I remember when the signing was announced on it was like BBC or Sky Sports and, and in, in all the comments on the on the article in Twitter obviously delighted Newcastle fans really salty Arsenal fans Arsenal. yeah um but there was a French uh, there was a French journalist um who he, he he I found his comment really interesting I went on his bio and he was like a legit French journalist and he said a lot of Newcastle fans seem to think that they're getting a defensive midfielder and he said he's he's so much more than that. He, and he said his best position is as a number eight. Mm. And he would apparently I said I didn't watch Leon, but he was playing like the left of a three. And mm. they had Kakare or Kakare, I don't know how you pronounce his name, but he was playing Holden role. And this French lad was saying he's 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 got so much more to his game now. If you think, I think we need to find a good anchor man to sit alongside Bruno. And then mm. I think the other position can get taken up by Willock or Joe, Joe Linton. Ed. And maybe if we're feeling really romantic, maybe Elliot Anderson, because he's he's yeah. looking like one for the future. But um, but regarding Bruno, every time I've watched him play for Brazil since we've had it, since we've signed him. He always seems to make an assist or, yeah. or do something. score a goal. Or yeah. score. Brazil. And if you combine the total minutes that he's played for us, if you were to put mm. all the minutes together, what it can't be more than what six, seven full games, mm. and he's got three goals. Yeah. So as a box to box midfielder, is this? Am I looking through my black and white tinted glasses here, saying we may be? might have a central midfielder who could get into double figures, goals a season yeah. in Bruno. Well, he does. We're going to talk about him more later, but um, we've got some stats for him. But he does, Eddie Eddie Howe, after the game, pointed out, he does he does everything that a midfielder, you know, he, he does the defensive work and he does, he gets into attacking positions. He kind of plays more than one role because he's so good and because he's so composed. Yeah. So... That's why it cost the money he did. Um, and we are, don't worry, we are going to talk more about him um, because of what happened at the end of the game uh, and because he's he's phenomenally good. But um, yeah, so it's going to be interesting how we go about that 
midfield rejig if there is a rejig in the summer. And I kind of agree that Joe Linton is the stats back it up. He's brilliant at blocking. He's brilliant at defensive work, winning the ball back, um, and he's good at driving forward with the ball. But he's not. He's not composed. You know, he's not composed to to keep the ball sometimes. And as soon as he gets anywhere near the box, obviously he's jigsaw. He's, he's still just bit. gets it caught yeah. under his feet and. Yeah. But um, but the second half then started, and the second half started with 80, 20 possession for Leicester. So they were really, they were really on top. But again, they weren't actually creating anything. It was just like the Brighton game, you know. They were playing nice football. They were pop, they were popping it around. But then after kind of 10, 15 minutes, we kind of wrestled some con- control of the game back, and we'd had we were having more shots than them on the break. They weren't very threatening shots, but. That was what was happening. Both teams made some subs quite early. Um, so to try and kind of, I don't know if it was to try and win the game or it, it felt, it felt to me like after about 65 minutes that both teams were just settling for a point, you know, uh, that was, that was quite, that was quite happy. That I was fine. That was fine by me, especially when, when West Ham scored against Burnley um, to keep that gap. But it felt very much like this is a game that's just going to, Kind of meander out, meander along, and peter out into into a draw that everyone will be satisfied with. Um, and then, and then, so we got to we got into injury time, and then Leicester had that they had a kind of half little chance where Dubravka had to be quite brave and go down and get them win the ball. It wasn't a shot, but it was kind of a chance. And then they had a corner on 92, 93 minutes. Which uh, I think Big Dan Byrne got rid of that with minimal fuss, and then it got to ninety-four minutes, and it again it was it, it was down our end of the pitch, and I, I need to give Matt Target some credit here because what he did was he shepherded the ball, he stopped their play from getting it, he kept it in, and he he popped a pass down the wing for Joe Willick who had fresh legs coming on, he. He did a he did a really good first touch and then a brilliant second touch where he basically just kicked it down the wing and chased it. Yeah, I think it was whoever it was was trying to chase him. You know they the midfielder stepped in too much and he just got beaten and Willock was absolutely away. And then he he managed to get the ball across deflection. And I, do you remember do you remember Yedlin's dive and header he scored against Bournemouth a few years ago? It was yeah, one of those yeah. ones where the defenders were scoring for us. It was a little bit like that, but there was a there was a, a, a still of this goal where Willick was like in the box, or he was like getting towards the box, and Bruno wasn't even in the picture yet. He yeah. was still an hour half, and he just he sprinted. He's absolutely I, I saw diving headed today. into the top corner. What a goal! I saw something today that when after Willick, I can't remember which player it was. After Willick burst past the Brighton player. Mm. His next touch, Bruno was twenty yards behind him. Yeah, um, it was I saw it, someone put that on Twitter today. Uh, uh, it was an uh, agent, agent Jared Gillard. I think he watches the Two and Under podcast because he's a he must be a New, Newcastle fan because he was he was giving us that little bit of extra time. It wasn't really extra time, but we were we were you were pleased about that one, weren't you, Dimmy? We were past ninety four minutes. Yeah, so because there's plenty of refs out there locally in in UK who. As soon as that fourth minute or whatever it is they call four minutes, if it's four minutes and zero seconds, ref points to his watch and says, that's it, game over, finish. But yeah. fair play, he saw a counter-attack going. He goes, all right, one more attack, see what happens. And and fair play to him as well. Joe Linton was rugby tackled off the ball yeah. by, I think it was Mendy, to try and stop Joe yeah. Linton getting in the box. I don't know why tackling Joe Linton, he won't score in the box, but that's okay. <laughs> he turns yeah. Joe Linton down and um, called, called the advantage, which, which was great. And then obviously... Bruno with a sensational diving header. Yeah, it was just... I remember we, we conceded late against Watford, against Southampton earlier in the season, and it, against Everton in the 97th minute. And it's that that feeling in reverse. Chelsea. What, it's just, yeah, against Chelsea, heartbreaking there. That feeling in reverse is like... It's, you know, it's one it's 1.30 in the morning and you're like, you just know... I was all ready to go to sleep. I was like, all right, that's yeah, all right. That's a nice result. Nice draw. I'm going to go to bed. That Then that happened. And it was like, all right, I wouldn't be getting to sleep for three hours. <laughs> Absolutely yeah, amazing. 
sometimes with the time difference we have to watch the games with, sometimes a draw can be the best result because if you win, you're too high. If you lose, you're too angry. And a draw, yeah. you just like, I, was, I was, I would have been, I would have been asleep ten minutes after the game finished if it had finished one one. Oh. But instead, I was up for another hour and a half watching it on repeat. So Bruno, Bruno um, is. He's equaled his tally that he scored for Leon already with three goals. He said himself that's the first header he's ever scored. We're, we've already talked a little bit about him, of course. But let's just give him some love. Look at these stats here. So I, I don't know if you've seen his heat map, but it's it's quite ridiculous. It's just like he was absolutely everywhere. He had 45 touches. He won eight duels. He created one chance, eight dribbles. He had four shots, all of which were on target. He obviously scored his two goals. He covered 11.6 kilometres, which on average footballers t- tend to run about 10 kilometres. I think that extra kilometre he made it was probably in the when he went and scored his goal. He ran all the way up the pitch in there, put his header in the top corner. But, mm. Jamie, you've already kind of talked about Bruno a little bit. Dimi, just talk to me about Bruno Gimareish and how, how has this guy ended up playing for Newcastle? It's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, the the quality and the, just the absolute brilliance that he shows on the ball. It's just night and day to what we've been used to probably in a very long time. My, most of my lifetime, I haven't been used to a midfielder like this. I mean, mm-hmm. he's been, he's been absolutely sensational. And the fact that we've, we've got him now at the start of our project at the start of our sort of when we're going up and the, the just the sheer quality on the ball. I mean, the, the guy is just brilliant. I mean, he's a Brazilian national team player. Who, when, when have we had a Brazilian national team starter, sometimes starters, bench player playing for us in the Premier League? I mean, it's it's amazing. And the fact, like you said, he covers every blade of grass. He he defends. He keeps the ball. He's shown he can score goals. He does it. He does it all. He's the absolutely complete midfielder. Like, like Eddie Howe said, he's the complete midfielder. Mm. He's, he's, he's 24 years old, you know. Um, he's not even really at his prime yet. And like like you, Jamie, I didn't really, I don't watch much of Leon. I've got a, you know, a young yeah. kid, and I don't have time to be watching French football. I've barely got time to be watching Newcastle games. But, um, so I don't know that much about him. But you, you can just tell that, you know, the moment he stepped on the pitch for Newcastle, he came on and he did that little bit of skill in his own box against Everton. Yeah. <laughs> it was like what you do, but. There was there was another moment yesterday where he, was, he had it on the wing and he just he just flicked it over someone and ran ran onto it you know and he's just got he, he wants the ball he's got so much composure and so much quality the the nearest comparison that I can think of in my kind of thirty years following Newcastle is probably Johan Kabay. Um but I think Bruno is a little bit he's a bit taller he's he's got a little bit more stature mm. um, and he just seems a little bit more of an all round midfielder. Um, Kabai was, you know, phenomenal for Newcastle, but um, Jamie, yeah, what do you, you know, you've talked talked about Bruno already, but you know, what what do you make of of him in that uh, game yesterday? The the rea- like I said, I hadn't, I, I'd heard of him, but I hadn't seen him much in play. The reaction from other fans and, and other journalists when we signed him was just was was insane. People, you know, French journalists saying we'd signed the best midfielder in the world. Um. I've got a mate who was a Liverpool fan who I don't know if he actually knows what he's talking about or if he just says it, but he said to me, oh, he would get in our team. And I was like, really? Um, so in my lifetime, I, I said this to my dad yesterday, he is already up. The, the best central midfielders I've seen in my life as Newcastle fans have been Rob Lee, Gary Speed and Johan Kabay. Mm. Can't really put Genie in that Genie Van Aldem in that category because he didn't really play that role for us. Yeah, and obviously he went on to Liverpool and was amazing. But I think he'll surpass them. Um, yeah, it's insane that we got a player like him. And it, when people call us deluded as fans, if we can sign players of the quality of him and Trippier when we're bottom of the league in January, mm. with a very, very they took with a very 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 high chance of getting relegated. It's just it's it's hard to keep your it's hard to keep your expectations low. I think Eddie Howe tried to do that, didn't he, in the press conference? Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, he's ju- he's just incredible. He just doesn't seem to have a weakness. Mm-hmm. It's not just his technical ability, but it's the fact that he's an athlete and he's quick. Uh, yeah. yeah, 
you you usually when when players like that come to clubs like Newcastle, there's usually some kind of red flag or some reason why bigger clubs yeah. or more successful, more established clubs haven't signed them. Um, but with Bruno, it seems difficult to find find that. Maybe people just didn't want to pay the price, or they were waiting till the summer, and we've just stepped in. I think um, we have. I think we've stepped in, and the best thing about it is we're not like thinking, oh, he's, he's so good, there's no way he's going to stay with us, Man United or City mm. or Liverpool are going to buy him. It's not going to happen. <laughs> he's, he's, he's ours. I'm, get, I'm getting so overexcited here, but I'm thinking of like David Silver at Man City, you know, that, that comparison of somebody who can come in and who can, not not for because we're a similar type of player, but someone who can come in and grow yeah, with just, the club and have, yeah, that, have that success with the club. Um, they, I think it's really underrated. I know City's spent a lot of money on some rubbish, but the fact they got company silver and Aguero mm. so quickly. Yeah. And that was like the spine of their team for, su- for such a long time. Um, if we can do something like that, that would be brilliant. But certainly I think Bruno's he's built the team around him. Yeah. I think it's safe to say that would definitely be happening. And I think the, the, the management by Eddie as well to bring him in gradually, even when the, there was a lot of clamour um, to bring him in. Um, I think he was quite fortunate, well, not fortunate because he'd coached the players, but the three midfielders that were in there were doing well and we were we were picking points up. But I think that, that enabled him to bring him in and ease him in slowly. And I think he got to have a look at what the league's about. And I think he's, he's ready to go now and I don't think he'll be um, on the bench for any more games from now on. Yeah, absolutely not. So that was the game. So we've we've won two one, thirty seven points now. What about the man of the match? Um, I want to. There's someone else I do want to mention as well as Bruno. I'm going to give it to Bruno because he scored two goals, and he scored a diving header in the ninety fifth minute. Mm-hmm. But I want to. I want to have a word for Emil Kraft as well. Um, not just because I've been defending him for weeks now, but the last two games he's actually been good. He's been better than I thought. He yeah, could he be, and, that, and that's what I thought he actually had in him. He had seven seven tackles in this game, three interceptions, and he, he won eight of his ten ground duels. Um, he has he is a player who I don't th- didn't think was Premier League quality, but now all of a sudden I'd be happy to have him as backup for um, Trippier for next season. He's would you keep him ahead of Manquillo? I would at the moment. Yeah, I think um, I think he he has shown that. He's been coached well, and he's got a good manager. And he'd be—I'd be more than happy to have him in as backup for Kieran Trippy for next season. So yeah, I'll go with Bruno for man of the match, and um, Kraft a close second. Dimi. Yeah, Bruno has the obviously because the ninety-fifth minute winner, but but yeah, Kraft's been amazing in the last two games. He's made two, I'd say, goal-saving blocks um, in two games. It was twice he got beaten, but didn't give it up and and made a crucial block, I think, against Fabio Silva for, for Wolves and and yesterday, I think, against Lookman. So, no, fair, fair play to Kraft. He's, he's been sensational. Yeah. He did he did that. The, there was a double block and then there was also, he did a brilliant piece of skill. I think it was Cher who got caught dawdling on the ball and when Leicester were pressing. Mm. And I had to double check. It was Kraft who got himself out of the situation. But the most... the the most mental way you can put his turnaround is so I obviously we're expecting Trippier and Wilson to come back soon. Mm. Now I think if a player comes into the team and plays well, I think Eddie Howe keeps them in the team. I think that's how he manages. I think, you know, mm-hmm. he, he feels that the fringe players, they have to have that belief that if they are in the team and they do their job, they'll stay in the team. There's actually like even a chance that if Ke- there was a talk that Trippi has got an outside chance for Norwich, mm. there is even a possibility that when Trippi is fit again, he'll have to wait to get back into the team because of the form of Emil Kraft. That is just insane. <laughs> You're right, Lou. You're right. That, that that thought crossed my mind that he, he likes to ease his players back in. And if we don't need to be risking Trippier on games that don't mean much, and if somebody's playing well, yeah. I think I, that. I think- I can I see that happening. About, I think the same about with Wilson. I, personally, I wouldn't drop Chris Wood for Wilson if Wilson was fit for the next couple of games. I, you know, Wood's been Wood's done his job, but yeah, Craft Craft has just been 
like you said, he's just been well coached and the whole team is starting to get an identity now. And it's just, even if there's injuries to key players, you know that whoever's going to come in, they might not have the individual quality of the player they're replacing, but they're going to be as tactically well drilled and know their jobs. And I think Kraft's mobility helps him a lot. Um, I mean, you said, Jack, you've stuck up for him. I was actually, I thought he was terrible at right back, I'll be honest, but mm. I was kind of sticking up a little bit for Graham Jones when he was playing him on the right-hand side of the back three because he's literally he was the only player we had at the back with any pace. Mm. So I think that helps him with the fact that he's an athlete and he gets up and down. But but yeah, it's been... Um, I said I didn't think I'd see another turnaround in a player as a Newcastle fan as we saw under as we saw for Modi Army. Mm, yeah. He basically went from a number 10 into like the one of the best defensive midfielders in the league. Yeah, for six months, uh, yeah. Yeah, for six months. And then with Joe Linton and now Kraft, it's yeah, it's 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 crazy. It's absolutely crazy. But long may it continue. Yeah. Long may it continue. We are rising up the league table. We are going to have another little quick break and we'll be back to talk about the Crystal Palace game, which is coming up on later this week. All right, so we are playing Crystal Palace, which is 4.45 our time, Dimmy, I think, yeah. which is a yeah. 3.45 for you, Jamie. All I can say is good luck with that one. That's yeah. on Thursday morning. Um, oh. That'll be... That, that'll be fun, a fun time to get up. Um, we'll have a little look, just have a little look at the league table with Palace. So we're, we're on the same point as them now. They've played a game less. They had their they had their cup game against Chelsea uh, overnight, which they lost 2-0. But if you look at the form, they're actually not doing too badly. They've only lost one of the last four games there. And they were draw, they've had a couple of draws and a couple of wins. I think it's probably safe to say they've had a reasonably good season. Is, have either of you watched that much of them or seen much of them? Yeah, I, I, I've when I have watched them, um, not the last few weeks because I've got a new baby, but the last few when I have watched them, I've been really impressed with um, how this has been said. You know, this isn't exactly reinventing the wheel, but how quickly Vieira's changed the style. Um, I think they're an exciting team to watch. I think Olise is a hell of a player. Mm. Um, so yeah, they, I think it'll be a very open attacking game. I think, um, yeah, Palace have gone from having Roy Hodgson, who's un- wound up at Watford this season, but they and they, they lost him and they lost, they lost a heap of players as well. And they had to, they spent a bit of money, but they had to integrate a lot of players, um, quite quickly. And, this is uh this is their team that they played against Chelsea. So we don't actually know how many of you like what their team's gonna look like uh when they play us. But yeah, they've got some good players there. Eze has been obviously been injured, um, but Connor Gallagher has had a fantastic season. He's somebody that he's somebody that our Craig from the Tune Under Pod has been he's kind of raving about and he hopes that Newcastle can sign him. So depending on what happens with Chelsea's situation, that could be a possibility. Yeah, he'll be chomping um, a bit as well, won't he? Because he couldn't play yesterday. So, yeah, and we've they've also got Zahar up front, who um, scored you know, scored a few goals against us in his time. Um, I don't know about the possibility of them kind of having a little bit of a hangover from this Chelsea game. Um, I hope that they do, and that they've kind of put a lot of effort and energy into this cup run, and that. You know, they are on the beach, as they say, a little bit, and that we might be able to be in a good position to to capitalise on that. Dimi, I'm just going to get up the team that you think Newcastle are going to play or the, that you'd like to see them play. Do you just want to talk us through this? Yeah, no changes, really, from from the weekend's game. I mean, Burn and Shea obviously picked themselves at this stage. Emil Kraft picks himself at this stage as well. Don't I don't think Trippiers will be back for... For probably another couple of games at least, and then and in the midfield, even though Willett came off the bench and he set up that goal with a brilliant run, I think it'd be pretty hard pressed to say that any of Shelby or Joe Linton will be dropped. Obviously, Bruno's not being dropped, but 
be hard pressed to say they'll be dropped. So even Elman Almiron on the right wing, he was I thought he was fantastic this morning. Worked really hard, won the ball back, looked, yeah, he looked was. quite dangerous. So yeah, I'd, I'd go with the same team and hopefully Chris Wood with an extra twenty minutes rest rarely he comes off for us, but he came off this morning for about twenty minutes. So hopefully he's uh, he's rested and ready to go for Thursday. I was just going to ask you about Almer on there because it's it was quite interesting. Murphy was starting quite a few of games for, for Eddie Howe when when Maxi was out, and he was doing quite well. You know, and he's, he was hitting the post every five minutes like he seems to do. But he was uh, he was actually performing a good role for the team, and he was doing some good defensive work as well. So I was a little bit surprised when Almiron came in. I think it was against Everton, the first game he came in for. And he didn't have a great game. Obviously, we know he doesn't have that much end product. But when Eddie Howe came in, I always thought Almiron would be a player that he would like because he's going to run and he's going to work and he's going to do what you tell him to do. But maybe it's just his lack of end product that kind of sort of doesn't put him in, in line. And I think he's been widely talked about as a person who could be sold for a little bit of money to Spain this summer, potentially. Mm. Jamie, what do you think about that? Um, would you would your team be any different to that, or do you think? No, I think I think do? I think it'll be. I think it will be that. I think the only thing that I could maybe see how doing is Palace are very Palace are very energetic and very mobile in the middle of the pitch, and I wonder if Willock might be suited to this game. Um, but yeah, but one thing I noticed about Almiron, particularly in the first half yesterday, not so much in the second half. I think he. Out of the four players that would play the two wide positions, Sir Maximum Fraser and Murphy, I do think Almiron has more of a natural knack to try and get closer to Chris Wood than the other three. The other three are naturally wingers. And I think Al- Almiron tends to sort of gravitate in the field and bless him, he, I just sometimes don't think he has the the quality on, on the ball. But I mean, that except that flick against Wolves... To put Bruno in for Woods disallowed goal was was insane, but no, I'd I'd start with that. But yeah, um, I think we might see a surprise. Maybe Wilson on the bench or something, or yeah. maybe I'm maybe I'm still too hungover and tired from last night. <laughs> Almiron Almiron's actually played his best football for us through the middle, didn't he? When when Rafa signed him and he had yeah. Perez and Rond on there, so yeah, he's more of a kind of central player, yeah. but that. That South American connection with Bruno might be what's kind of brought him into the team a little bit and made how think that there's something there to work with. Um, what about? I mean, what about predictions for the game? Then it's hard. Like games are just happening thick and fast, aren't they? At the moment, um, it's kind of that's part of the season where people are catching up on games a little bit. This this one should have been played about a few weeks ago, which would have broken up that run of away games we had. Um, so. I don't know, you just play the games. Unless you're Jurgen Klopp, you just play the games when you get asked to play them, don't you? And you just get on with it. Um, what about a prediction for this game then, Dimmy? 1-0 win with... I'll probably predict him to score every week, but more... Law of Averages says he's eventually going to score a couple of goals. Chris Wood to score. I'll take I'm that. I'm going to go 3-1. 3-1 to us. And I think Chris Wood will score. Um, and I think Willock and St. Maximum will score. I um, I notoriously don't like predicting wins, but I got the Leicester game spot on. <laughs> it was close, but I got it. So I think I just think we might see a little bit of a hangover for Palace. I think that mm-hmm. we're going to have another, another night game under the lights. Um, I think that we might keep them keep them out and score a couple of goals and I think it might be quite a comfortable quite a comfortable one which would be very very nice um, it doesn't happen often where we kind of get comfortable in games I think Brentford away is the only time I can really remember that happening this season as well as Everton when we went 3-1 up but that would be nice wouldn't it just a nice comfortable nice comfortable win take us to 40 points let us all just calm down and then look forward to Norwich at the weekend yeah. So yeah, we will all be up very early for that one. Uh, on a work day, <laughs> yeah, actually, no, it'd be good when the season finishes, so we can have a little bit of a break. I, I actually, I've, I've, I finished work at two o'clock that day, so I'll, I'll, the game will finish 
about six. I'll try and get another hour's kip, which won't happen. Won't happen. Nah. Wishful thinking. Good and luck then, with that. I've only got six hours work that day, so it should be okay. Haven't you got a three-week-old baby as well? Uh, yeah, she's got three and a half weeks, yeah. <laughs> you will not be going back to sleep at 6 a.m. Yeah, it's... Um, it's <laughs> yeah, probably not. All right. Yeah. That, that was a bit of a quick Palace preview, but we spent, you know, we spent more than enough time talking about the main man um, and talking about that win against Leicester, so... Thanks very much for joining us, Jamie, in Japan. No, thanks a lot. I was, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Really enjoyed it. No thank worries. And thank you, Dimmy. Cheers, mate. Another good week for your uh, another good weekend for your teams. You're a lucky charm at the moment, apart from yeah, apart from Essendon. Forget about them. Yeah. <laughs> right. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Tune Under Pod. We're on Facebook, Tune Under Podcast. Uh, subscribe on YouTube and the website is www.tununder.com and we will be back for a review of the Palace game uh, it will probably be yeah, later that day or next day for UK viewers and a little preview of the Norwich game as well. Cheers guys and we will see you soon Ta.